Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Jennifer Franklin. I'm the program director of the Hudson Valley Writer Center. We're so happy to have you with us today as we continue our 2023 reading series. If this is your first time joining us for a reading, welcome. We hope you continue to come to our online readings, classes, and events. Please check out our website for the complete list of offerings. We hope you will also join us for our next reading um, on Wednesday, February 15th at 7 p.m. as Yesenia Mantilla, Kiko Petrosino, Cynthia Manick, and Sonia Greenfield read their new poetry collections. Don't forget that on February 26th, Claudia Rankin will read with Emily Skillings on Zoom. As always, I want to thank our founder and founding editor of Slappering Hall Press, award-winning poet, Margot Taft Stever. I want to thank the other co-editors of SHP, the members of the SHP Advisory Committee, the board of the Hudson Valley Writer Center, our teachers and our students who are the beating heart of the center. We also want to recognize the foundations and organizations who support us, including the Bydell Foundation, the David G. Taft Foundation, NISCA, and Arts Westchester. Thank you so much to my colleagues, Christina Papadopoulos and Sophia Bannister, both with me tonight for all of their hard work. We are so excited to have the Dolly Anthology with us today and our, the wonderful co-editors, Julie and Dustin. We're thrilled to have you here. We're so glad that you came to us and asked us for, for this anthology event. And I'm turning the evening over to both of you. Welcome, Dustin. Welcome, Julie. Thank you so Thank much you. for um, I just want to echo the gratitude to Hudson Valley for having us tonight, for being so open, for being so welcoming, and your level of communication is so thorough, and it's just very much appreciative to be working with you. So thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Christina and Sophia, for everything that you've done to make tonight possible. We truly, truly appreciate it because we just did two launches, so it's nice to not have to do anything, even though we did enjoy it. <laughs> So how it's going to work tonight is everyone will be reading their poem from the anthology. We'll be reading in the order that they fall in the book. So you will see one poet twice tonight because she has two awesome poems in the anthology. Um, so that is not a mistake when I drop the reading order in the chat, just in case people want to follow along in the book. So if you have a copy of the book, I'm about to put the page numbers with the poet's name. So you can just open it up and follow right or wrong. After everyone reads tonight, there'll be a Q&A. We hope you can direct it to myself or Julie. You can direct to the poets. However, whatever is burning in your mind, please do not be shy and put it in the chat. Um, we Poets love talking, right? So give us questions so we can just keep talking. Dropping this order in there. Where did it go? There we go. And that's how the evening's going to go. And I'm going to turn it over to Julie, and she's going to tell you a little bit how the book is set up. Take it away, Julie. Is the stage mine, Dustin? <laughs> I feel like I have to say that from Wild and Precious Life. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit, very, very briefly, about how the anthology is organized. Um, so the title, Let Me Say This, is actually a riff on... Um, just because I'm a woman, which would be, let me tell you this, but Dustin and I liked, let me say this, um, because it was more of an invitation to bringing in everyone. Um, so the book is divided into four sections, including the intro and Dustin and I felt very strongly, actually very passionately about ensuring that each section reflected either, um, a song title or lyrics or different points throughout, um, Dolly's career musically, um, so far. Um, so the intro opens with um, a line from the You're the Only One, which is take me back to where we started from. And then that is both um, Dustin and I's introduction, as well as the 75 lines from Dolly 75th um, that kicked us off with the limp wrist issue that then went on to, of course, inspire the anthology. Um, in section one, uh, we start with the the title, It's Time I Showed the World Just What I'm About, which is from Girl in the Movies. 
Um, section two is uh, trying to find what feels like home from travel and through, which is the Academy Award nominated and Golden Globe nominated song written for the film Transamerica. Section three is read into it what you will, but see me as I am from Backwoods Barbie. And the last section of the book, Guide Me and Keep Me, is from The Seeker. Fabulous. Sorry for my cat has not seen me all weekend. So he's in a constant meow state. So it could not come off mute quick enough. And everyone, if you're wondering how can you stay current on everything that we're doing, because we do have some exciting things happening, possibly a reading in Nashville that we can't really talk about yet. So I, this is vague booking, I guess, vague zooming, but it will all be on that link tree as things get finalized, as we do interviews at all events, whether they're virtual or in person, they will be um, on our link tree. So I am dropping that in there. So you can just subscribe to the link tree and anytime we make updates, you'll automatically be notified or just bookmark it so you can stay um, in touch. So with that, we're just going to get this reading started with our first reader of the evening. Yay, now I can unmute. <laughs> I was trying. I'm so happy to be here with you all. I'm Katie Manning. I'm in San Diego, so it's early here. Um, I do not have a copy of the anthology with me because I took it to school so that I could brag about it to everyone and show them the, uh, the uh, copy of it. So anyone who walks into my office is bombarded with it when they when they come in. It's right on the edge of my desk. Um, my poem in the anthology is uh, what I'm calling a broken golden shovel. So uh, the words from Islands in the Stream are uh, on the right margin, and then they go out, and then they come back in again. So you'll hear that as I read it, if you're familiar with the song, which I assume most, if not all of you are. Dolly, when I met you, there was peace. Your songs were my earliest islands. I learned to set a small needle gently in between black vessels, to sail away on the intertwined voices and leave the stream of sadness behind. Then there was that summer my sisters and I watched, no, that is not the word, belted along with you, what we heard from the screen each day when we alternated rhinestone cowboy with Mary Poppins. Between then and now, you've been almost perfect. You mail books to millions of kids, denounce racism with a smile. Do we think our little wide asses are the only ones that matter? How you can also be my island, a place where I can't be wrong and everything is nothing for a while. I still sail with you sometimes when I need to get away, back to my grandparents' house, back with that record player, back somehow to me. Thank you. Hi, I'm I'm Beth Gillis, and uh, I want to thank Julie and Dustin for including me in this amazing anthology, and also Hudson Valley. Um, and it's wonderful to see all of you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and uh, I'm just I'm just going to read this little poem. It's um, it's a villanelle, so you will um, hear the repetitions that are part of the villanelle form. It's also a, a, a story, a sort of narrative about Dolly's relationship with Porter Wagner, which was both loving and fraught, um, as you will learn from the poem. If you don't already know, if you know her story, you know this, um, this story. And it also references the poem, or the song, I Will Always Love You, that was her, she wrote it for Porter in order to get free of Porter and it worked. Um, so anyway, this is called Breakup. He couldn't own the core of who you are. Although he tried to keep you in his net, take all the credit for your rising star. His pretty little thing, you'd strum guitar and belt out songs beside him. Your voices met 
and blurred songs the witness of who you are were pouring out of you back then demure you stand beside him with downcast eyes on set you knew you had to leave your rising star just coming into view his arm a tether and a weight you smile you loved him yet you wouldn't see the core of who you are you wrote i'll always love you the words like fire tore through you as he listened heard you get your freedom with his tears you risen star forgave lawsuit slander paid off his debts and more held hands and sang to porter on his deathbed i'll never be that good dolly you are beyond me a living saint a guiding star Wow. Um, I'm Kelly Russell Agadon, and I am thrilled to be here. I'm wearing my Dolly Parton shirt. Um, and I just want to thank Dustin and Julie for probably the funnest anthology I've ever been in, and also the best marketed and um, most celebrated. I really appreciate your good work, and thank you for including my poem. Um, this is just, it's just been a joy to read. Um, so the first poem I'm going to read was inspired by um, some Dolly moments in my life from um, seeing her on Steel Magnolias to watching, watching Grace and Frankie and her having a cameo there as God to watching RuPaul's Drag Race and seeing the Vivian and Evie Oddly lip sync to her song. Um, so that's what kind of inspired uh, the moment. And it's called Were It Not For The Moonlight. Were it not for the moonlight, for the I've never been to Dollywood eyeshadow, an eyebrow pencil, and a sense of style, Truvy's cuppa, cuppa, cuppa cake, it might rain fruit cocktail or a sackful of appreciation for fruit cocktail because we were so thankful for Dolly to play God on Grace and Frankie ready for goodness in the world, to hold a Jolene cocktail of sweet tea vodka, peach schnapps, and cheer the minty dolly like someone muddling the world, and taking what we love to make mojitos, singing, here you come again, as the drag queens dress in their large blonde wigs and lip sync in cowgirl boots, while I repencil my eyebrows, add a little extra mascara because we're all a little tipsy and dare to be beautiful. All of us who love icons, who smile and stumble, slow dancing with the moon. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Jennifer Wheelock. And like all of you, I want to um, thank Dustin and Julie, um, your tireless efforts for this anthology have been just incredible. And I am also very pleased to be included in it. Um, I think my poem is self-explanatory, so I'll just launch into it. It's called Lesson Two, God's Country. That's what my mom called East Tennessee. If I questioned why this corner of our state was more heavenly than other places, she declared, the Great Smoky Mountains, Green Hills, Four Distinct Seasons, and Dolly Parton. I only ever wanted to leave, longed for any coast, saw the sea as a promise of something bigger on the other side. Some Sundays after church and fried chicken, we drove the 30 minutes to Sevierville to slow roll past Dolly's old home. Pine needles danced on the car hood, the roads were narrow and the windshield wipers whined. In front of the rickety cabin, I imagined Dolly on the front porch, envied that she sang herself out of there. Maybe that's why she still can sing tenderly about it, the way I learned to love you because I left. 
Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Isaiah Viennese. Um, I'm so happy to be here and so happy to be included in the anthology. So many thanks to Dustin and Julie for including my poem. Uh, my piece is called My Broadway Crush Covers Wildflowers. So uh, Wildflowers was a song that Dolly recorded with Emmylou Harris and Linda Rodstand for an album that they did together in 1987, which was the year I was born, actually. Uh, and I really love a particular, thank you so much for, I'm so glad you like the title. Um, I, I really love this cover that Andy Mientis did. So Andy Mientis is this Broadway singer that I had a huge crush on. Um, and he is also a queer artist. And I was thinking about how much uh, Dolly's music means to us and how much also a song about leaving the country and going to the city is really a queer narrative. And so that's what this poem is about. Uh, this is my Broadway crush covers wildflowers. Decades after Dolly's recording for Trio, he makes his own way and I'm drawn into the sweetness of his tenor. I've long moved from my hometown. Now boys in New York call me beautiful and babe, hold my hand while we walk under the lights of 42nd Street. I often forget the quiet grass of my childhood until a tune like this marks the distance between now and then. The kid, that kid is long gone and I rarely miss his loneliness. Tonight, as my crush kissed me at 48th and 9th, pink blossoms fell from the sky. Then we drank wine and talked for hours. I rode the train home, listening to wildflowers again. I thought about Dolly writing the song and how she may not have known what it would mean for queer men like us, how such music carried us to the city where we could finally grow. Thanks so much. Wow. Yeah, I was the one who loved that title. A great poem. Um, so this is my second poem in the anthology. And um, it's probably true for all of you here is like, if you could pick a life coach, it would be Dolly Parton. And just kind of by her words and her actions and her lyrics, um, which is kind of, again, what inspired this poem is that she really is giving us lessons. So um, as I read, you're welcome to um, hunt and listen for lyrics and, and some quotes by Dolly. Dolly Parton is my life coach. Because I worry about everything, I dream of Dolly making biscuits and milk gravy while reminding me my desire is always greater than my fear. I understand the garden is never tidy. And here you come again with big dreams and faded jeans because the last thing on my mind were the red shoes from the bargain store. She tells me I better get to live in and there's no such thing as a dumb blonde, but only silver threads and golden needles and no one in between. And when she laughs, my weaknesses have always been food and men in that order. We order chicken and dumplings, have a picnic on a cloud with beauty beyond compare and laugh. What a way to make a living. Thank you. Well, hey there, everyone. I'm Colin Kelly, and um, I don't think this poem needs any uh, introduction either. Uh, but it's called Roosters and Hens. And thank you to Julie and Dustin and Hudson Valley for hosting us today. Roosters and Hens. Rumors fly fast in Southern towns, like the one about my grandfather shacked up with a 16 year old he found hitchhiking to Florida on New, on New Year's Eve. He'd be in jail today, front page news and canceled but in 1981 rural Georgia, it's just more grist 
for the gossip mill. He parades Missy, his little gal, at the gas station, five and dime, buys her milkshakes at the Dairy Queen, makes her go to the store to buy his six packs and cigarettes. The day he brings her to my house, my mother stands cross-armed and disgusted in the driveway as they argue over his indiscretion. Missy sits in the car, snapping her gum and singing along to Here You Come Again on the radio. I've got that 45, I say slyly, leaning into the window. Her eyes light up and she looks me up and down, reassessing my worth. Dolly is my idol. I want to be just like her, boobs and all. Only four years separate us, but Missy in her tight jeans, tank top, and tall blonde hair seems much older, worldly and wise, sure of herself. And when she casually asks me if I've ever kissed a boy, I feel seen for the first time. Missy tells me absolutely nothing, changes the subject when I ask about her family, school, or where she's from. My grandfather drops us off at the movie theater to see Nine to Five. Missy slings an arm around my shoulder and we sing along loudly to Dolly's theme song. I can feel the other moviegoers staring, touching and harumphing their disapproval. When the scene ends, where, where the, when the scene where Mr. Hart chases Dolly, Dorley around his desk and she threatens to get the gun out of her purse and shoot his dick off, Missy laughs and claps. That's just like your granddaddy, but he ain't caught me yet. Our eyes meet in the dark, and even though I'm 12, her implication is unmistakable. You'll just have to shoot him then, I say. I won't tell. Her shrieking laugh brings a chorus of shh, and I taste her bubblegum lipstick for hours after she kisses me unexpectedly on the lips. Missy is gone by spring. She disappears into the night with an envelope full of social security cash and grandpa's gun, doesn't leave a note. He rages for days, duped and lonely, begs mom for money to buy his pap's tall boy. I don't tell them that Missy made one last stop before she left town. The morning after her disappearance, I find a small brown bag propped on the windowsill of my room. Inside is the 45 of nine to five with big haired Dolly on the sleeve, marching off to work, carrying a paint roller like a staff a garden hoe, blueprints, jumper cables, work boots, and other odd job tools slung over her back. I've lost track of how many times I've watched nine to five, spoken Dolly's dialogue back to the TV and wondered if Missy ever had to use my grandfather's gun or turned any roosters into hens to get where she was going. And this is that 45 that was left outside my window. Thanks, everybody. Hi, um, I just wanna say what an honor it is to be able to like hear everybody's um, wonderful work. Um, this is really exciting. Um, this is one of the first poems I feel like I ever wrote whenever I had a good idea of what poetry actually is. And it's more about um, growing up in Southeastern Kentucky, just like a few hours away from like the glamorous shadow of like Dollywood. Uh, Dolly was always like a very like large benevolent like figure always looming in my life. And so I guess this is what this poem is about. Conversations with Dolly Parton at 3 a.m. Sweetheart, she says, her voice like the opening strum on an auto harp. Once you let anyone steal your sunshine, you are your own rainy day. She holds my head like Madonna and kisses my bangs. She reminds me how she birthed entire patchwork mountains from her hips. She's Gaia, spangled in rhinestones, hairspray and long almond nails. She gets called trash, but trails like you wouldn't believe. Our holy mother of looking like a trick and letting all sorts of sinners seek shelter somewhere. You got mountains inside you, sticks and rocks and bramble. She holds my face and laughs like honey on biscuits. It's hard enough being a woman, 
especially if you like making a show of it. She adjusts the cups of her brassiere and tectonics crash. Sometimes you gotta let things go simply cause they're heavy. She smudges the coal dust around her eyes and two coats of mascara. A swallow won't sing unless prompted. If you can't stand to give all your love to one, she says, knowing full well what it means to have all your love fracked away. Thank you so much. This is so awesome to get to hear so many poets that we have not been able to experience them reading their poems. So I was fangirling out and getting to hear so many people that we have not met yet and to meet you virtually. I know it means a lot for me and I'm sure Julie will have something to say on that too. So Absolutely. We, as we were saying at, at the launch, so we did two launches, one in Florida and then one in Atlanta. And, you know, Dustin and I have spent so many, so much time with the poems, you know, in editing capacity and organizational capacity and promoting capacity. And then you, you get so caught up in that you forget the wonder and awe and joy that goes along with hearing the poem through the writer's voice. And so every time both launches we were both in tears and i'm i'm feeling the same today to get to meet so many of you virtually and then also hear the poem coming through your voice and your cadence and your inflection so thank you for being willing to join us today and share that with all of us so we're at the point where we can take questions they can be directed to anyone to everyone whatever you would like to ask, don't be shy, throw it in the chat. We have time. Everyone's being shy, no questions. Well, thank you to all of you who are adding notes in the chat too and being so supportive of these poems and and mentioning what you like and what resonates with you that is it's such a beautiful thing for everybody to be able to take a look at that so thank you for sharing too i'll ask a question for our contributors so it's open to anyone who wants to jump in just bake yourself maybe i'll just go ahead and start asking contributors to unmute to make that easy if we can do that um I'm just curious, did you ever think you would write a Dolly poem? And what did you do to make your poem happen? I can go. Um, well, I had been watching RuPaul's, I watch all RuPaul's Drag Race. And so um, that was part of it. Like that was the first thing that came to mind. And then I started like listening to just Dolly over and over, like the, you know, Alexa play Dolly playlist over and over just to write down like lyrics and words. Um, and then I just really thought like, well, what, what would a Dolly poem mean to me? And then that's where the life um, coach came from. And then the other part was, I realized she has just really been in my life forever like I, I can't remember when even as a little girl um though my one I didn't get um hard candy Christmas is my very favorite Christmas song and I that's my one mistake I didn't get it in a poem I tried <laughs> you could still write that <laughs> <laughs> Tim has a uh, uh, posted a question in the chat he wants to know what was the first Dolly Parton song any of us heard Anybody want to take that one? Me and little Andy. Mm. Which made me just cry uncontrollably for days. I was like a little kid when I, because I used to watch her show, her own variety show that came on in the 70s on Saturday night. And she sang it on there one night. And I was just like, you know, sobbing uncontrollably because it's so sad. Yeah. I think that might have been my first one too, Colin. But my favorite was Here You Come Again. That was my Mine favorite. Absolute, absolute favorite Dolly song. Absolutely loved it. I think mine's Jolene. Classic. 
Mine's love is like a butterfly. And I think we must have been watching reruns of her show because I just remember sitting by my mom and seeing Dolly in the swing. Mm -hmm. I think the first Dolly I ever heard was, must have been a Christmas special in the early 90s. (laughs) She's in a red sleigh. (laughs) Um, And, you know, her hair is very big. It's like 1993, maybe. And I just thought Dolly Parton made Christmas music as a child. And so that was what I first associated with her with was Christmas. And my grandparents had the duet records. And uh, so yeah. that's, <laughs> so I knew that she did duets in my, my earliest days. My oldest sister um, took, uh, or actually no, my mom, took me and my niece, I have a much older sister, to Bessel Whorehouse in Texas. And so I got a lot of really good songs there, though my sister, when she found out that she had taken us there, was not pleased. But my mom said, well, it can't be a bad movie because Mr. Burt Reynolds is in it. (laughs) Kelly, that movie, I saw it on TV as a kid and I was sobbing at the end and my aunt was like, why are you sobbing, you know, Dolly's with Bert? And I said, but all these women are out of a job and don't have a place to live. Like I was just torn up and upset. Yeah, that's where called. Hard Candy Christmas comes from. <laughs> and look, I was going to show Dustin and Julie. I didn't get to bring this the other night to the launch because it was raining and it's really fragile and I didn't want it to get damaged, but I don't know if y'all can see this. Oh, wow. The Dolly doll from... Is it 1970, 1975? Oh my God. I love it. Wow. Yeah. Thank you, Colin. I'm so glad you brought that because I know you mentioned that the other night. Yeah, I just didn't want to break it in because it was raining and I didn't really- No, probably very smart. Um, it, for me, it could, have, it could have ended up in my bag too. So that was probably, yeah, probably so. <laughs> exactly for me. The first song I remember memorizing, I don't remember the first one I heard, but the, the one I remember memorizing was the seeker, um, which I write about a little bit in the introduction um, in part, because to me, it seemed like a petition and a prayer, you know, to keep coming to find me. And it's become really intertwined with the way that I sort of see Dolly too. Does anyone else have any questions? Because I'll throw another one out. I'm curious, uh, our contributors, who's been to Dollywood? It's going to be a two-part. Who's been to Dollywood and who's been to Dolly concerts? Concerts. What's that? So share something about what was something that you really enjoyed. Uh, the, I'll tell you, the concert that I went to in 1998, I believe was the year she started substituting drag queen for Jolie because she had a full stage full of drag queens at her Atlanta show at Center Stage Theater. It was a very intimate theater. I was really close. Wish I had an iPhone back then to get photos, but she had all these drag queens on stage with her here in Atlanta and changed the words from Jolene to drag queen. And it was... A treat to be there to see that. I love that Dustin works that detail into his poem too, by the way. Mm-hmm. We have we have a question. Does anybody else before I ask this question want to talk about going to Dollywood or a concert favorite memory? This is like the perfect group to talk about this stuff. We get to nerd out on Dolly. This is like a safe space for just gushing <laughs> it all out. Okay. So the question is, have you heard from Dolly about this poetry collection? I am still alive. I've not had a heart attack. So when you hear from Julie that I have died, it is because Dolly has sent us a letter or something. We're, we're very hopeful because she's known for sending letters on that pink stationery with the butterfly. Mm-hmm. So I'm just, that is what I am like, it would be great to meet her, but my heart just wants that because I just want to frame it. Because I mean, I'm going to sob if we ever get to meet her and the pictures are going to be horrible. So I can't hang that up. So I, I need the letter. So. But um, the cover photo, I will add, we do know that she has the book. 
because the cover photo was released from Dolly for us to use. Uh, and so we interacted with a handful of people on Team Dolly because it is a, definitely a team, <laughs> each person working their own part of the process. And they were all extremely kind and very, very generous. Uh, it really made me think how you hear that Dolly surrounds herself with people that sort of exudes some of the things that she does and the expectation of how you interact with people. And her team was just unbelievably kind and amazing. Julie, do you want to add anything on? Uh, yeah, well, I what really floored us was we had asked about uh, the cover and they came back, Team Dolly came back with five different images. And so Dustin and I, as we did many times throughout this anthology, said, okay, you look at them, I'll look at them and we'll pick. And not surprisingly, just like with the section titles, just like with most of the poems in the anthology, we both had narrowed it down to two and then we decided between those two which one would be on the cover so it just spoke more to the serendipity and and of our kind of working relationship with it that we really had a very similar vision i think from the beginning really with all of this so and i still can't quite believe like i i had the book cover made into a poster behind me as you can see like i i hung it up today and i was just like how is it possible that all of this has come to be it just seems wild because it began with Dustin and I going to our first Dolly, well, my first Dolly Parton concert, Dustin had been very experienced in this realm. I was the one with the transgression. So he said, okay, when Dolly comes to in concert in Georgia, we are going. And so we did. And that was kind of, kind of everything that kicked off, gosh, like 10 years ago. Yeah. I, I never thought that I would, Julie and I would be texting, have we heard from Dolly's attorney today? Like I might <laughs> It slapped me like my dreaming, like this is a thing that emailing and typing every day for like th three weeks. It was, it, it was wild to, to, that it happened. I think we, we, I mean, we both cried the day we got the email. Like, oh, it was very, absolutely. Yeah. In a good way. Well, and it's good to be able to breathe and kind of share now some of the backstories because there were, you know, we had extended the, we extended the submissions call and then we, you know, deadlines kind of got very compact. So now it makes sense as to why, because there were so many other things kind of going on behind the scenes that we couldn't speak about until we got to a certain point. So. And the other thing we mentioned the cover, the, we're very proud if anybody has the book, um, the back cover has murals. There's one from, Co I was about to say Costa Rica because I'm going to Costa Rica, Costa Mesa, um, California, strut bar at the top, which actually was vandalized um, a few months ago and the mayor um, contributed funds so that they could repaint it. So I thought that that was super cool. Uh, recently just said to someone, I was like, I, my taxpayer money can go to repair a Dolly mural. I'm totally okay with that. My taxpayer money can go to make Dolly murals. I'm okay with that. We have Chicago, the Lytle House is an event space, um, lesbian owned, which is exciting because 52% of the contributors in the anthology identify as being part of the LGBTQI community and roughly 72% of the anthology contributors are female identifying. So we're quite proud of that. And then the last two murals I'm trying to point so you can see are from Nashville for Kim Radford, who does a lot of Dolly art. And Katie, it has the quote that you use, Dolly, as we call it, we call the one in the middle, Black Lives Matter, Barbie, Barbie, not Barbie, sorry, Dolly, uh, mm -hmm. because it has the quote at the top. And we were quite thrilled. We made sure that it was on there because we were trying to get the images to fit and it was cutting off some words. And I was like, no, it has to have all of it. I was like, look at the top. It's, it's the quote. We want the quote on there. It's our, you know, little way of being political and to me, that speaks to Dolly because people think that she's not political, but if you really listen to her songs and you look back through, she's an extremely, she's an extremely political person in what she writes. She just does not make political speeches or get into such things. Got another question. What was the hardest part about editing an anthology? Wow. Um, wow. The hardest part. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were stressed when we had to extend the deadline and as a, I, I work in compliance in my day job. So I'm very much about rules. This is what it is. And so we asked people not to rewrite Dolly songs. Cause as Julie always says, you can't mess with perfection. And I got really frustrated because for a period we were only getting song rewrites. And I was just like, oh my gosh, 
are we going to have an anthology? Because we literally have 30 straight submissions that are all song rewrites, even though like bullet two of the submission guidelines or don't do it. So I think I had a, a moment of like some doubt, like, is this going to happen given that? But I mean, working like with your best friend, it was amazing because we really have been on the same page. I mean, we've had minor disagreements, but they are like so minor. Um, and for the most part, everything has been on par. Like there are a few poems and I think it's important for contributors to know, like if we didn't agree on something, we talked about some poems for 30 minutes to an hour and a half. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not kidding. We would, most of the poems we were both yes, yes. And then some were like a maybe yes. And then so we would say, okay, make your case. And we would just talk about it. And sometimes we realize, okay, we've depleted our time for today because we only talked about two poems for three hours. Um, so it was a lot, it was, I think we probably spent more time working than we thought we would, uh, but that's because we wanted to be fair, consistent and make sure, you know, that we're being true to ourselves and being true to Dolly. I, I had more phone calls than I've ever made in my life, but you like in general, like we were on the phone. It's some, some nights it was like all the time, like in our, yeah. we were running over. I didn't get dinner one night. And my boyfriend was like, were you going to eat? My boyfriend brought me food because I was like, I can't get off the phone. Like we're, we are almost yeah. done. Like, we think we're going to finish tonight. And I mean, it, it was very, it was very time consuming, but the um, joyous part. And then I'll turn it over to G because I'm talking too much. Seeing it all together was emotional. And I didn't think that that was going to happen. And Beth, because she's a dear friend teasing me as I'm aging, I, I, I have become more of a crier later in life than I was never. I was always an ice queen. And I just sobbed when we, when we saw it all together and not even with the cover, like just knowing that we had sequenced it and had a book, like it just blew my mind that it was about to happen. And I was just, everything that we sacrificed time-wise and rescheduled was so worth it seeing mm -hmm. that beautiful document. Absolutely. You could never talk too much, Dustin. It's fine. I think for me, I mean, there's, there's so many things that I could speak to, but one of them um, is it's in, it's one thing when you are working on your own work and your own book, but it's another, when you are stepping into a space where you are taking care of truly nurturing everyone else's poems and work. And Dustin and I felt very, very strongly, um, about our commitment to that for the anthology, but also very humbled and very reverent about that. And so, for example, when we were putting the book together, I can't tell you how many times we had calls where we read poems out loud. We read the whole book cover to cover out loud because we were so determined to not have a single comma out of place, to not have something that wasn't unified, to make sure that everything lined up just the right way. Um, and so I, I find myself like it's, it, it sort of defies description verbally for me to be able to say what it's like to witness you all step into space and read these poems, as I said earlier, you know, through your voice and through your body and through your cadence, because we've worked with them so long on the page and then watching them just kind of bloom off the page has been this really gorgeous and really overwhelming and reverent experience. Um, I think the other thing that was really tough is we had a lot of poems that just didn't fit into the trajectory of what our vision was for this. We had a lot of poems that were incredibly inventive, very cerebral, um, doing things with homonyms like Salvador Dali, Dolly Parton. And we were so jazzed about some of the um, avant-garde ways in which people approach Dolly. And it was really cool. But in order to be able to follow the vision of this anthology, they didn't fit in. And so that was really difficult sometimes to have to turn um, some of those po poems away. But we were blown away by how creative everyone got with the assignment. And it did help mitigate <laughs> the issue with having a number of people rewrite um, song lyrics, which I, I can't stress that enough that if, and of course, mostly everyone here knows this, but if you're submitting to any kind of journal or anthology to just make sure you look over the guidelines um, because you've already got a, a tough case to get past if you've rewritten Jolene, for example, let's just say. Um, but overall, I mean, I, I can't express enough gratitude really, or, um, you know, gracious energy toward Dustin, because I mean, we've been friends for a very long time, but you don't know how that's going to translate into a working relationship. And while we worked on Limp Wrist together, 
working on an anthology is an entire, entirely different um, geography, different continent, right? Um, but I'm so thankful to Dustin because we really truly did get along with almost every single turn. And there were a lot of turns and a lot of late nights and a lot of calls, a lot of stressing, sometimes both of us <laughs> losing sleep over certain things. But we always managed to kind of be in balance, which is another, you know, there was sort of that ballast was kept in front. So if Dustin was really wrestling with something, I think I kind of brought him back. And if I was really wrestling with something, he kind of brought me back and it just worked really, really well. So um, I could not be more grateful and thankful for that too. And the last thing that I wanted to comment on was the sense of community that has come up because of this book. And I love that even more because it's Dolly, right? So when we were first, so two things, the first was when we began talking about this project, one of the very first covenants that we had, and I love the word covenant for this, because Dustin and I felt so passionately about our editor's royalties going back to the Imagination Library, like we had to return something to Dolly, it had to be full circle. And then the second part was how many people were willing to just step in and help in the extended community. So as, as one of the stories that I love to tell is the book lady photo that's on the back. Um, we had asked a number of folks in Nashville if they could take a picture and for what, take a picture of the mural for the cover. For whatever reason, we kept running into snag after snag and we were getting into deadline and thinking we were not going to be able to pull off this back cover. We were so stressed about it. But it was important to both of us to be able to have amplification of Dolly through poetry, but also through a visual space, right? So that you have this contrast of kind of the black, white, silver, and you flip it over and you have this beautiful burst of color that's dolly all across the country. Um, but we didn't have the image for the book lady. And as you know, the, Dolly's favorite moniker is book lady, right? So we were really fretting over this. And at the last minute, somehow I remembered that I had a neighbor who might have family in Nashville. And so this complete stranger went out on Thanksgiving day to take that picture. So I really love it. And she made it into a whole family event. Like she took her mother and father with her and they kind of drove around the city and took pictures of Dolly all around Nashville, but also this. So I can't say thank you enough to Catherine um, Compton who took that the, the photo of uh, Dolly on the back. And she's a lifelong Dolly fan. So it was just really great to be able to include her too. And now I'm the one who's over speaking. So Dustin, I'll put it back to you. I'll give a shout. Travis Collinsworth, the um, Black Lives Matter Dolly is at um, the five spot in Nashville and he's a co-owner and he took multiple photos to make sure that we got what we needed because we were struggling with that. So that support was just surprising and amazing. Like but how people come together through Dolly, you know, the Jad Abram Rob and she, Sheila Ali's podcast, Dolly Ponton's America, they call her the great unifier. And it is like everybody, you know, while I don't want to hang out with Trumpers, to be honest, like there are Trumpers at Dolly's concert and nobody is out of line. Like it's out of respect for Dolly. Like nobody, you know, I, I don't even feel like I'm holding hands with another guy that I'm being stared at at a Dolly concert. Like, you know, I don't feel, it's just everybody puts everything aside because she is really the great unifier. And Kelly, I want to say thank you for your comment because Julie and I, we spent a lot of time on the notes section. We felt it very important. We know that we probably by a lot of people's standards over-documented, but we just wanted to make sure that all credit everywhere was given. So like every little song that is referenced, like you technically really don't have to do what we did, but we just wanted to be very clear. And it was really important to us because Dolly is about giving people credit too. You know, she doesn't take more credit than she deserves. So it just was very in the spirit of Dolly too. And also Julie and I are just like that. We're, 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 we're not OCD, but we, we, we get that in the detail. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, there's nine minutes. If nobody has any questions, I mean, I can nominate Julie to read her poem. I love her poem. If everybody think, let's get some nods. We should hear Julie read her poem, right, y'all? <laughs> Go for it, Julie. We, we need to get you in here, though, too, Dustin. Yours is far shorter. Um, I will, thank you. I, I, that's, I wasn't anticipating. Um, so just very quickly, um, Dustin and I both, there's a fun backstory, but as we were working on the anthology, we both said, oh my God, neither one of us have a Dolly poem. 
<laughs> so it turns out that I was actually searching for something that I had misfiled and I put um, Dolly in the search field and this draft came up and I went, wait a second. I have a draft of a Dolly poem from when we went to the concert in 2011. I couldn't believe it. Um, so I started working on it and Dustin also started working on his and we made a pact to not show one another what our poems were until toward the very end. And it turns out that we both wrote poems in response to concerts, which is also wild to me. Um, so I will read um, this poem. The title is Dolly Wood, but it's W-O-U-L-D. Um, and I do have to say that if it sounds like Dolly speaking, it is Dolly, it is not me. You can see that when you read the poem on the page, but when you hear it, it's a little different. It's too easy to pigeon forge Dolly into nine to five, double D twang, to not heed her better day concert advice. Darlin, own your truth. Because Dolly became Dolly in a fallen chapel of deep woods, Tennessee, strumming into the air, praising into the only tongue she knew. Her congregation of God, song and sex, naked graffiti lusting sanctuary over the walls. The sexuality, the spirituality, the sensuality, that's exactly who I am, she tells Dolly Parton's America. The joy of the truth I found there is with me to this day. I had found God and I found Dolly Parton and I loved them both. And don't forget how they all tried to stop her, but even daddy couldn't have whooped the glitter out of her as she snuck out back to press poke berries to her lips, line her eyes with black and match tips, or how she'd head over to town just to witness some something something strutting down the walk, goldfish swimming in those coveted acrylic heels, an invocation for this woman's town trollop red nails, breasts booming forward, all a beyond compare, to the eventual Jolene. And all the mothers saw this too, said, oh no, ducking their heads, checking that top button for good measure, already forming the trash words they would whisper later over fences. I admit it. I too used to see only wigs and corsets until I finally got it. Only so much fake could be true. And tonight, Dolly proves it, pulls in the lights all around her, invites us to pour into that same cup of ambition, all five foot something of her who yodels, fiddles, plays bluegrass, raps, then can't, belts gospel, all a cappella in her little sparrow, louder than a thunderstorm, sending chills through 98 degrees of solid humidity, whooping us still under cowboy hats, all the faces painted just like hers, smiling back from their derelict hearts into a song of every last thing unsaid. A woman married decades who writes heartbreak like she's lost every last time. This country blood in all of her colors shakes herself to fire in rhinestone fringe, opens the butterfly down in me, holds the mic to the voice I never allowed, says, own your trash, says, make a joyful noise, says, Jesus. And I want to tell her how my shut mouth was my loaded gun. My quiet khaki was a way to hide. I was taught never to be noticed, learned that my peace kept my father's hands from raising, my mother's voice from breaking, that the good girl took almost 40 years to realize she wasn't, and good wasn't best besides. I am not my own island in this stream, but now together you and I, Dolly, we sparkle and quake. We are holding everything, walking down that same city street, the higher the hair, the closer to God, singing mighty after mighty fractured song, stomping our glitz and sex and Jesus, praising with every last step. And here we come again, God, and there I go. And, and Julie's right. read now, Dustin. <laughs> and Julie's right. We did. I had a. I have to thank Costco Pinot Grigio and um, the Wild and Precious Life for my poem because I, after some poets read, and I downed the bottle because I was starting to get sad that I wasn't going to have a Dolly poem. 
and then it happened. But before I read, I want to give a plug because we're trying to plug this as much because we want to save the date because we're actually asking you to save the date for January 19th, 2024. You're like, what, what, what? So we're doing a one-year anniversary party for the anthology at the Betsy Hotel in Miami. If you do not know the Betsy, it is a fabulous hotel, but they are such supporters of the literary community. They run the Betsy Writers Room where you can apply and do residencies. They are extremely fantastic. And if that noise is coming through, sorry, it's cat feeding time. His feeder is automated and it sounds really loud to me. Uh, but the Betsy is amazing. So you should check it out and apply for the residencies because um, they're just, it's just amazing what they put back into the community because they love poetry um, and literature. So 119.24, we'll celebrate the book and Dolly 78, hope to see you. Dolly at the Fox Theater, 2008. My mother glanced at my shirt as we waited, said, I don't know why you wore a Dairy Queen shirt to see Dolly. I laughed, told her to look again. My shirt says Dolly Queen. She looked away like something else caught her eye. The tour bus door swung open. A redhead exited first. It's Dolly's best friend, Judy, I whispered. Dolly waved as she walked down the bus steps, pausing at the bottom to listen to what we, her fans, were yelling. Early in the show, Dolly asked if there were any drag queens in the audience. My mother fidgeted in her seat. Someone near the front row jumped to her feet. Well, usually the drag queens come dressed as me, Dolly laughed, before launching into Jolene. When the chorus, when she sang the chorus for the second time, she crooned, drag queen, drag queen, drag queen, please don't take my man. The crowd cheered. I screamed, yes, my mother looked to her lap. Seated with an auto harp, Dolly told us about her coat of many colors and love for her mother. She asked if there were any mothers in the audience. A few yelled, several hands shot up, including my mother's. Well, I dedicate this song to all the good mamas out there. I placed my arm around my mother, squeezed her tight, leaned my head against hers, gave her that moment. So thank y'all for being here and the contributors again. Oh my God, thank you for saying yes to that. I mean, you're in the book. You could ditch us now. I hope you won't. You won't ever. But thank you for being here and making it fabulous and let us hear your voices. Please Google the link tree. I tell people, if you just do, let me say this anthology link tree, you will find it because we do have some exciting things that we can't wait to brag about. Wish I could say more, but there's a couple of exciting readings that will be in person and contributors, you will hear about it first because we will be emailing you. So just please stay tuned. And if you're in, you know, Nashville, maybe towards the fall, maybe there'll be something you might want to come to. Um, Julie, close us out. I think you've done a pretty good job, but thank you everyone for being here today. Thank you to Hudson Valley Writers Center for hosting us. Thank you to Jennifer. Thank you to everyone that tuned in and listened and everyone that supports Dolly. So um, just be sure to keep on writing Dolly poems. Oh, you know what, Julie? I messed yeah. up. You reminded me to do this. I'm going to own yes. it. So we do want to share. We have a little signature thing. You know, Dolly comes back out and sings, I will always love you for. Yes. Um, Thank so you, Dustin. Know it's coming. We always, and Julie said, don't forget. And I did. We have a quote to close out with, and it comes from Dolly Parton's America, episode nine, She's Alive. Maybe something we've done might inspire people to do a little better. Mm -hmm. everybody do a little better yes amen thank you all so much what a great reading thank you for being here with us and we will have this as a recording on our youtube channel in june so if you missed any part of the reading um 
And we'll send you the link, Dustin and Julie, so you can send it to other contributors in the anthology so they can watch. Thank great. you all. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.